Настя, привет. Привет. So I'm switching to English um, to welcome uh, the next speaker who is joining us right from the uh, right from Africa and from the African region from South Africa. Please, Nabuntu. Yeah, you're here with us. Uh, thanks so much for joining. Uh, I see that some people are already joining, uh, are also joining us uh, for this uh, webinar. So uh, we can slowly start. And um, yeah, I just want to share a, a couple of um, words um, about the experience, uh, about the background of the speaker. Uh, so Nabuntu has a, a wide background in creative industries. And uh, basically, I guess he knows everything about every kind of creative tool or industry. So yeah, you, uh, you can talk to her about many, many things um, from TV, from running TV shows to uh, developing digital tools and new products and running them uh, from zero, um, you know, and implementing them into the market. So, um, but obviously she will uh, speak about herself better than I can. <laughs> so please, I, I hand you the mic while um, some, new, uh, some new listeners are joining. Please, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Anastasia. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much to Global Gate and Emerge Speakers for inviting me here today to speak. Um, I hope my lighting is fine. It's just started going into nighttime, so um, I hope everyone can see me and hear me okay. Um, like Anastasia said, I am a creative economist, and what that really means is that I studied uh, a read a master's in London around how to exploit the creative industries, um, or rather how to exploit the creative economy by exploring all the creative industries and the way that we can work within them. I'm originally South African, and I found that once I had finished my undergrad degree in filmmaking and live performance, there were a lot of barriers of entry into being entrepreneurial in that space and really developing my own business, my own career within it. And so I just wanted to study and understand the best ways to use creative processes to solve problems, but also to build my own business and um, really understand this new age of the digital epoch that we're in and how that impacts creative industries. So today um, I will just be focusing on how I've used those creative tools, what I think those creative tools really are uh, in alignment with digital spaces. I'll also just be speaking to how you can use those as somebody who may want to come and work within South Africa and perhaps even as a South African trying to attract foreign investments or foreign stakeholders or foreign partners. Um, also knowing that I, what I say is not a monolith on how it, to work with South African businesses, um, but perhaps just some clues, some examples, some guidelines um, from my own lived experience and also a lot of data and research that I've looked into. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, just so you have my information in the background, I think I can do that. Uh, I hope I can do that. <laughs> Doubting my own yeah, skills. Yeah, you should be able because we, we give that permission to the Zoom call. Okay, perfect. Okay. There we go. So that's just going to be my information in the background for anyone who wants to get a hold of me. I think it's a good uh, opportunity now to kick off. Uh, basically, the best way to start is to answer a question on how I believe creative tools really accelerate our businesses as people. And the three key points that I think allow a business or an entrepreneur to accelerate their business by using creative processes and systems are design thinking, transmedia storytelling, and lean models. Now, design thinking is essentially a process of designing, well, design thinking essentially, that came into practice to start allowing people and business people to think of design as a solution-based process, rather than just designing and not solely in the idea of designing architecture or designing um, cities, but designing a product and designing a um, service that anyone may want to give to consumers from around the world. And so when we then put that hat on and we think to ourselves, well, if I'm going to use creative processes and creative systems, 
what does it benefit for me to be a design thinker in that context? And what essentially for me, it showed me in understanding design and thinking is that when we create a business that has solutions at the heart of it and uses design thinking to develop every product, every process, what you're immediately doing is that you're creating products that are consumer-based because you're looking for problems within a society and you're trying to create solutions for those problems. And therefore, unlike the models of the 50s, the boomers that we saw in the Western world that started creating products to convince audiences they needed in. We are now creating products that audiences are asking for, consumers are asking for. And so by applying design thinking as a primary tool at the heart of our business, we are already ensuring that we can be sustainable, that we are desirable to the consumer, and that we are essentially going to constantly be innovating. Because when you look at a problem, you are then driven to innovate and change and at best be a disruptive business or a disruptive entrepreneur. So that is the first point. That's the tool and system that I would highly recommend from a creative perspective that we find within creative industries and the creative economy that can be applied to every single industry and really quickens the way your business can scale up. Secondly, is transmedia storytelling. Now, transmedia storytelling is something that requires perhaps a full day workshop in terms of understanding how effective it is as a tool. And I'd highly recommend everybody who's in this talk to go and look at what transmedia storytelling is. I became um, familiar with transmedia storytelling about 15 years ago and was just dipping my toes into it. And essentially what transmedia storytelling is about is allowing somebody to tell a single story that lives in a holistic environment and touches several different points. So an example, the lemon that's on the backdrop of my presentation, if I wanted to sell that lemon, how could I sell it? I could make lemonade, I could start taking photos, I could use the color palette to influence my house. And already from that, I've got four different products or services from the single idea, the single product that I've created that can live on several different platforms. And in a more realistic way as a business, how you can use transmedia storytelling is that when you have a product that you want to sell or a service that you are trying to get out to people, the story behind that should be able to exist on a plethora of platforms, whether it's social media platforms, whether it's word to mouth on the ground, whether it's traditional lin linear television, you should always be trying to work to ensure that you are not only focused on this insular bubble or a single market, you have already created a transmedia story that exists either as 30 seconds on Instagram, as one minute on Facebook watch, as a 10 minute series, weekly series on YouTube. And on the ground is a theater performance where people can come to your health service or your engineering service. Transmedia storytelling allows for you to touch a wide audience with a very, very effective uh, process, which is what takes us to lean models, the final part and the final tool and how I think that you can accelerate your business. Lean models in a link to both design thinking and transmedia storytelling shows us how to create business with using cost-effective methodologies. So rather than spending a massive, huge budget to then go out there and make a $20 million film that you don't know that people want. If you've applied design thinking where you said, well, what is the market missing? What type of film is the market missing right now? What stories do people want to hear? You find your answer. Marvel is a wonderful example of this. They found that, okay, comic books um, have become overly saturated in the printed press. Let's bring them up to the cinema stage, introduce new audiences. Over 10 years, they spent 10 years using transmedia st strategies where they sold products of the um, of the characters in the movies they referred back to the comic books they had wide wide range of um let's call them market-based festivals in the form of comic con film festivals where that was on the ground and it was in person and then they kept it and i know it's very hard to believe that Disney and Marvel were lean but really Iron Man the first film was a very small budget film 
for what is considered a big budget film in Hollywood. And from Iron Man, we then got to Infinity War slash Endgame um, with Infinity War breaking the box office and finally beating Titanic as the most highest grossing film uh, internationally of all time. That was a 10 year journey, but without throughout that whole 10 year journey, the acceleration of them now being the dominant filmmakers, i.e. Marvel Studios, was a process of using design thinking, transmedia storytelling, i.e. being available everywhere, and being cost effective with how we use our money. Do you really need an office space? Do you really need to spend money on those products? Or is it something that makes you seem more professional? Um, with digital tools aligned with creative tools, we can really start accelerating our business and take it to the next level. The next subject matter that I'll speak to is really understanding how South African consumers consume their content um, and how they reach their content. Now, most South Africans, like uh, many emerging economies around the world, are consuming their content on their phones. Um, this is not exclusive to emerging markets, but because of the great disparity of wealth where a lot of people in South Africa don't have access to fast running internet, their phone is often more affordable, more accessible, and allows for them to consume content at a lower quality visually um, than it would be to buy a high HD smart TV for their homes. So data has shown, and also a lot of empirical research has shown us as a business who creates content that we should really be focusing on creating content that people watch in their hand, on the go, on the move, which you, you observe in developed countries too, the Western world, whether it's Asia, a lot of people are consuming their content on their phone. South Africans are no different. The only difference is because they're emerging market like uh, India and China, even Russia, the BRICS cluster, Brazil, um, the Southern and Central Americas, those emerging markets have a higher drive on their mobile because of cost and the cost that comes with having a smartphone and a smart house. Um, the platforms that we are observing a lot of South Africans consume content on, whether it's advertising, whether it's products and services, or whether it's just movies um, and short clips, the higher percentile are watching on WhatsApp in South Africa, which is something that was also quite evident in the Southern and Central Americas. Uh, that's closely followed by Facebook and Twitter, and then other social media platforms follow quite closely behind. And I think the reason WhatsApp is the leading platform is that it is personalized. A lot of people are also now running their businesses on WhatsApp. So it's become a tool that essentially is a design thinking tool and allows for people to also exploit transmedia storytelling and telling their stories, whether it's on a story or chatting to their consumer instantly right there. And there is no barrier in them being able to advertise themselves. And it's just so much more cost effective. So if you were a business and you were trying to enter the market and trying to engage with South African consumers, understanding where they're watching their content, consuming their content is really important because you could spend 10 million rand on an advert that you want to put on traditional linear television and none of them are ever going to see it because a lot of them are too busy, are working too hard and or are just too focused on their cell phone to move to that linear platform that you've put on, uh, put your product on. Another key and I'd say um, quite a specific South African and perhaps again an emerging economy um, phenomena in terms of where content is being consumed and content is being created actually is in social gatherings. The word of mouth culture in South Africa is still quite prevalent, is still quite a key driver. And I think also is an indicator and a validator of why WhatsApp is the biggest platform that they're consuming their content on, because we still want to engage with each other. There's still a personable desire of how we consume content um, and how we create that content and how we tell our stories. So social gatherings um, in the form of, we call it a braai or a, it's known as a barbecue, coming together to celebrate is a, is a space where there's still a lot of content, um, transfer, content creation, and content consumption. The common mistakes that a lot of new entrants make when they come into South Africa is three things that I have distinguished and I would advise that one notes when they want to enter this new market is that 
most new products and most new businesses which enter South Africa focus only on the urban environments and Western businesses in particular focus on Cape Town. So you'll find that they'll go down to the tech summits down in Cape Town and they'll take that data as an as a reference point of what's happening in the tech world in South Africa. And it's really limited because Cape Town is the most westernized city in our country. So it, function in a, it functions in a very Western way, socially, uh, product consumption way. And that's not the higher percentile of our country. The higher percentile of our country is African and operates from an African perspective, doesn't have the same wealth that lives in Cape Town. And so when you do your research and when you enter the market of South Africa, I would definitely recommend that you don't just look at Johannesburg, the city that I'm in, um, and Cape Town alone. Look at those and then also look and create a demographic that looks at uh, rural environments where there are villages and how people are consuming, consuming in villages, uh, township areas where there is small pockets of economies that are growing and, um, you know, really independent um, and grassroots based. So don't make the mistake of assuming that the urban environment in South Africa is the place that your product is going to succeed because honestly um, that is the smaller percentile of our country and that is the smaller percentile of the consumer so you'd be limiting yourself and yes the urban environment has the highest earning um, individuals in the country excluding farmers but that is still a smaller percentile as we are an emerging economy the second mistake that is made by a new entrant into South Africa is what I call distant research and what that ultimately means is that when we come into new markets, sometimes we come with preconceived ideas of how to research that environment. And so what I've experienced having studied in London is a lot of Westerners will come and if it's through social entrepreneurial work or a new product that they want to bring into the environment, a fintech product, a, a digital to help with transport, their research methodologies are based on Western methodologies. And so there's already a distance that's created between the African energy environment perspective and that Western idea dear of what Africa is, because obviously the largest relationship that the continent has had with the Western world has been through, you know, the Western invasion, but that doesn't help you if you're coming in. If you come in on a clean slate and you really re remove yourself from any preconceived ideas of this environment and this territory, that distant research methodology won't impact you because you will really allow yourself as a business person and as a business to develop your own relationship and to use the knowledge that you find here and now to determine how you're going to work in this new environment. The last mistake that people make is language. So I speak English quite fluently. I know when I speak English, I often sound quite British. That's because of my education and living in London for a number of years while I studied and worked. This is a misleading, <laughs> um, I would say, grasp of English uh, in terms of knowing that language, we have 11 official languages in South Africa and English is not the most spoken language. And so when you're developing this product, what language are you developing it in? Who are you trying to reach? Not that people don't understand English in this country, but to penetrate culture. If I was going to Russia, I'm not gonna say thank you, I'm gonna say spasiba probably say it terribly, but I'll still try. <laughs> um, because I know I'm in Russia. If I go to Brazil, I say obrigado. Uh, partner with people who understand language because I have found that language is the key into culture. And if you understand culture, you already understand what the consumer wants. You already understand, okay, how do I now apply my design thinking to set culture? So really, really look at that. And if you wanted to know, Isi Zulu is the most spoken language in the country because it is one of the largest cultural groups and other cultural groups within the country understand and speak it. It is a language also then opens you to other languages. Um, Setswana and Sutu are also very good languages to learn because within Johannesburg is Sulu and Setswana are the largest languages that are spoken. And Johannesburg is the most African city in our country. So don't, don't be tripped up by language. And you don't have to be fluent. You could just partner with someone who speaks those languages and make your life easy. And at best, really translate your product to all 11 languages so that you have no barriers with language. 
The next thing that I'm going to speak on is what type of content works in South Africa um, and what solutions will work for you as you come forward and enter the market space. And it's really almost like a summary of what I've said before. And I think that though I've said design thinking and transmedia storytelling are things that can be used in our emerging economy like South Africa, I really actually think that that's something you can apply globally. And so obviously, definitely coming to South Africa and entering this market, design thinking is at the core and at the baseline of design thinking is research and development, which is, you know, the number one way to allow your business to succeed and be sustainable. If you research your environment and your new territory and seek stakeholders who are not only established in that marketplace, but really focus on grassroots organizations too, who would struggle to even be on this webinar. Um, a lot of people who are making change in our economy aren't on this webinar because where it's been advertised and where it's been made accessible is not actually accessible to them for the reasons I mentioned before because a lot of them are not in the urban space a lot of them are not speaking the language or on LinkedIn and advertising themselves on LinkedIn a large percentile of them are on Facebook and are looking for content in their language so definitely ensure that when you're applying design thinking and transmedia storytelling your research is really at the core of how you enter South Africa's market the kind of content that South Africans um, are really drawn to uh, from a storytelling perspective which I think then trickles down into products because you know um, stories are what connect us as people I make films and theater and television content because I believe in the power of the story and so South Africans, like a lot of people, love humor. They love comedy. They love to laugh. They love to be made to laugh. Um, they enjoy religion. Uh, and when I say religion, it's it, gospel music is the number one selling music in our country. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not a massive consumer of that, but there are numbers that show that religious content around gospel music in particular is, is very popular with the consumers in the country. Music and dance, um, content uh, is a huge is a huge huge sell in South Africa people will film themselves dancing to something and I think it's because we're quite an innovative culture when it comes to creating new genres of music and so we apply that innovation for music into dancing and socializing and how we set trends uh, that maybe you might see on TikTok or Facebook but mostly on WhatsApp here and I would say the last type of content that really, really thrives in South Africa is user-generated content. People love to watch their friends doing things, their family members doing things. And again, this goes back to why WhatsApp is the number one platform. We, we love watching ourselves and we love generating and creating our own content because it gives us the platform without barriers to tell our story on our own terms. Uh, as I mentioned before, the most popular platforms to use and try to penetrate are WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, and Twitter. And how to really wow. spread the word about your product. I'm sorry, my dog is being talkative outside. <laughs> how to spread the word about your product when you come to South Africa. Wow. I'll mention research again, because what you do when you're researching is that you can create a smart enough template, which we often do here on the ground, is that we'll hire a number of young people, put a mobile phone in their hand, have them in taxi ranks. Taxi ranks are where a large percentile of South Africans within the urban environment and also rural environments catch public transport to get to work. And they're there early morning, just asking five question surveys and getting a phone number. They've already created a database. They've already got data for you to use and data is one of the most valuable things to use. So as a business, combining human resource with digital resources to then go and get that research is the best way to start getting people talking about your product and thinking about your product and going, hmm, what was this product that this person was asking me about? I wonder what it's about. And you leave them already thinking of that. Um, partner with diverse partners, as I mentioned prior. Uh, it's very important and one of the greatest mistakes I've seen new entrants make when they're in South Africa is that they'll look to see who's successful and they'll look for the successful businesses, uh, whether it's advertising agencies, whether it's top researching labs, and that's who they'll partner with. Unfortunately, a lot of these labs 
don't also have grassroots relationships. And so my recommendation is have a diversified portfolio of who you're partnering with when you enter the country. Look for the grassroots, the or come in and use the big ones, but then leave a budget so that when you're on the ground, you then engage with the grassroots prior to launching your product to ensure that you've really diversified and try to get as many different voices from our very secular and very large group of cultural identities in South Africa. Um, and this will help you, just one of the points I made was that what that helps you do is establish long-term relationships rather than short-term relationships. And so then you can look at being in this territory and look at it as a portal into the rest of the continent for the long-term versus a short-term experience. Um, and the last point I'm gonna to speak to is what local players can become partners in helping your product enter and win over the market. Now, this is quite a tough question to answer because it just depends on your product. And so maybe when we're doing Q and A, I can speak more specifically to anybody who wants to answer, who wants an answer to that. Um, it's really based on your own product in terms of what type of players you look for. And again, I'll go back to research and development. Once you research, you'll also understand, you know, design thinking, research, 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 understand who you're engaging with, and then you'll understand who your partner is. Um, I think assuming you know what type of partner you want from a business perspective prior to being in a territory can be dangerous and costly and wasteful. Uh, if you don't understand how the economy moves and how the people within the co economy use. So really apply design thinking to that answer as well. And, you know, why, for example, I'd say we are a great partner at Busabuntu Pictures is that we do do that. We, we are not a foreign entrant in South Africa, but I treat every consumer as a founder of my business. I treat every potential new consumer as a new, a new planet to discover. And we approach all of our new products or our new systems or new shows that we're gonna create as an opportunity to create a new universe. And so we're definitely a great partner to work with if you came to the country, which is obviously a selfless plug, but in, in the context of what I believe really helps um, build sustainable business within South Africa, you know, partnering with someone like ourselves is helpful because we are interested in discovering more about our own country, about the African continent. We're definitely interested in working with international territories as we have done for a few years. And using creative processes and systems for us isn't only for our disruptive media company, Busabuntu Pictures, it informs our nonprofit company, the Busabuntu Foundation too, because creative processes are used to solve problems and therefore we engage with social entrepreneurs um, and vulnerable people and empower them through observing them and giving them tools that really let them fly. So I'm definitely a great partner to work with if we're aligned. <laughs> so uh, in closing, I really think that the best way to enter South Africa is using creative tools. And those creative tools are, I think sometimes feel people feel that if you're using a creative tool in a traditional space, it won't translate into a digital space or vice versa. And that's just not true. That's not something we've found at all. We have truly found that if you can create a research template that you print out on a paper, that research template can exist on your phone as an app that people fill out instantly. And even the most vulnerable individual who has the lowest income in our community is using a mobile phone. So definitely make the mobile phone platform your friend going forward in terms of product development and consumer engagement. That's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's really insightful. And yeah, it's kind of a gate to an interesting and unknown uh, market for those, for the newcomers, for, the, uh, for those who come from the outside. And we've got a question. Let me look um yeah uh it's it's in the chat um yeah it says thank you so much for an insightful talk um could you name some of the largest uh digital players companies corporations in the south african market or some startups small businesses that are disrupting the market with their digital or creative solutions can you think of some so the largest ones are quite easy to think of because 
you know, we are, I don't know how many people listening are aware of this, but South Africa hasn't been an independent democracy for, we haven't, we're not even at 30 years old. So we're quite a young democracy. So mm -hmm. what that means is that we have big companies that have a lot of monopoly over a lot of these digital creations mm. and so the, the largest impactors the largest players and digital players are still the telecos so people mm. like mta people like vodacom and um, they have a big hold on it because they also control the data um, and i hope you understand what i mean by data in terms of like really what allows for you to be on the internet because we don't have wi-fi accessible everywhere in our country yet so you have to buy data upload it onto your phone and then that allows you to get onto the internet and to use digital apps and so because the telecos have control of the phone the sim card you put on your phone the phone number you have and then the data that you buy they are really the big bosses right now in terms of startups and small companies there are just so many mm. <laughs> and, um, and the truth is a lot of them which is what I was saying whether they come from Joburg or smaller areas a lot of them tend to descend down to Cape Town because of the trend of summits of digital summits being in Cape Town oh, so wow. I think if, if you looked up tech summits Cape Town you would find a large list of startups um, and the truth is those that are successful tend to get taken to Europe or America so they don't really stay in South Africa for African solutions which is what I was saying is that if you're trying to bring a product or a business into South Africa for South Africa um, the startups and the digital solutions that exist aren't really aren't really at those summits because a lot of the times people who ideate and work to get to those summits are looking for foreign funding to then go into that foreign territory outside of South Africa. So um, I can't give you exact names, but I can definitely mm -hmm. say just look for, for tech summits in Cape Town and some in Joburg, but I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. that great with that. Answer. Sorry, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, a question from me um, to add to that. Um, so are there um, like internal investors, are they invest? Are they investing in local solutions, like solutions that would um, improve their local ecosystem, uh, the digital tech uh, creative ecosystem? So yeah, they are. I mean, there's a company that's become quite popular over the time. I don't know if you'd call their solution digital, but it's definitely impacted how we access digital. They're called Vumatel. Again, there's that teleco name uh -huh. in there. Um, what Vumatel started doing about 10 years ago, I may be wrong with the dates, is laying fiber in the earth, specifically urban territories, to give access to faster Wi-Fi. Mm. And so they really impacted and disrupted the industry in terms of allowing people to access data and Wi-Fi a lot quicker. Um, anyone else who's creating digital solutions, you know, th there's a lot happening within digital health where people are trying to make... Uh, they're developing apps that allow uh, accessing health a lot easier. So there's a company called Discovery. Uh, they're a medical aid scheme. And again, they're also very large. They're, um, what do you call it? They're a stock market company. They're listed. That's it. They're a listed mm -hmm. company. So they're quite huge. And as Discovery, they've, they've really impacted e-health and created apps that allow somebody to go to the gym and get rewards while they're exercising and watches monitor their exercising. So these are very it's hard to these are products that people with money access the ones that access the higher percentile the majority of consumers actually tend to be traditional products that are just using digital platforms so what we're seeing on whatsapp is that people will sell their microphones their um used utensils they will sell mm -hmm. the shoes that they're making at home or they will sell any product or system that they make so if they are car washers or um they they paint homes they'll sell that product on a digital platform like whatsapp they'll create a little flyer for themselves and then they'll put that on whatsapp as their profile um if they sell wood in your neighborhood because they're wood fillers trailers rather 
that's how they sell themselves. So what we're watching in South Africa is lesser development of digital applications, but an exploitation of existing digital applications to uplift traditional and grassroots products. Mm. So that's really what's happening in our country. And then when we go to digital applications that are being developed, it's really still within those high earning environments because they're the ones with the labs, they're the ones with the money within them, their business to develop applications um, they're the ones also fostering an education around digital development, whereas schools and universities are only slowly starting to offer education around applications, systems, coding. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I hope that is your question. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, you've already named uh, the health, like e-health um, sphere, <laughs> how to... Uh, industry yeah how to name that uh, but the next question in the chat was about uh, what is hyping now in South, South Africa a service or a digital solution so yeah your names in um, health tech um, yeah giving giving grassroots initiative a uh, digital tool to uh, uplift for an uplift but maybe something else for example maybe something else uh, ra uh, raised uh, from uh, from zero to hero during the pandemic. I don't know actually what what were the conditions during the pandemic, because uh, I know yeah that, yeah for example in Europe like all of the um, um, like how would you say um, delivery services got like super successful because yeah people couldn't uh, go to shops and everything like that. So maybe something like this happened or. For sure, actually, you uh, you watch the business called Checkers, which is a food supermarket in South Africa, develop a app called 6060, and it was around delivering food. So we had similar conditions. We couldn't go anywhere but hospitals and shopping malls or supermarkets mm -hmm. to get food. Those are the only places we were allowed to go to in a hard lockdown. And so Checkers developed a app which is really booming and increase their employee count actually um, in terms of them needing people to drive the scooters and be delivery personnel. Uh, Woolworths, which is a, a affordable luxury brand in South Africa, had a similar experience. It's not as successful, <coughs> excuse me, it's not as successful as 6060. What really happened that was a massive boom over the pandemic, but it's not I would say abnormal or out of the norm for South Africa was the boom of music uh, and a, a, a genre called I'm a piano. So what we watched happen is that this new genre called I'm a piano was really growing in South Africa and South Africans were enjoying it on local radio. And then all of a sudden, because of the pandemic, people started loading their music onto digital platforms because they were no longer able to go to the club. And we were no longer able to have festivals and events where we were seeing one another. And within six months, literally an unknown music producer was performing in London this summer season because of them putting their music online. The genre has become huge in the Western world because of the access that those digital platforms gave to those grassroots producers. And it kind of democratized how music was going out into the world. And so that would, from my own empirical observation, content from a creative perspective, music, short films, short stories, you know, a lot of podcasts, goodness, the podcasts, <laughs> the endless podcasts. <laughs> we had a lot of podcasts come through. And so I think in the time of solace and using apps like WhatsApp and Facebook and YouTube, a lot of people created YouTube channels and just started loading themselves cooking. But music was definitely, and specifically the genre of my piano blew up. And that that's that's the hype right now. Like the South African brand is like, like, have you heard I'm a piano? So if you've got a product and you're trying to sell it in South Africa, definitely have an I'm a piano track in the background or an I'm a piano partner um, to help you market that because it has global appeal. <laughs> nice. Interesting. I've never encountered that. Uh, yeah, yeah you, should, you should listen to it. You might, might find yourself just like cooking some. <laughs> <laughs> and Valerian, that's 
asking, uh, what is your favorite podcast? <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's quite a it's a it's a cheeky podcast. It's not a South African podcast. I can tell you about a South African podcast that is controversial, and I don't even want to give you their name because I just think it's controversial, like a lot of um, podcasts around the world, because it's just two men speaking liberally without any any concern for the impact of what they're saying um, they kind of like they're just they're just boys so I'm, it's not my favorite but it's certainly the most popular because sadly controversy still makes um, money for people my favorite podcast is actually by a sexologist specialist from california in the united states it's called lovers and friends and i just love it because our country's so conservative in many ways and she discusses identity sexuality in a very interesting way and she's well versed in loving your body loving yourself talking to different people about how they view their roles in relationships so that's a podcast I listen to but really I'm mostly a reader I'm not really <laughs> I've been considering making my own podcast but did, I'm, I'm mostly you, a reader <laughs> yeah, did, did you have this wave of, of clubhouse app when it happened in the west Do you know this one no which one which ways clubhouse app Yes, you know, Clubhouse came to South Africa. People tried to speak to me on Clubhouse. I think the thing is, all of the apps that were everywhere, like Clubhouse, um, I've just had a somebody who's in the meeting and is actually a friend of mine. Hi, Dimitri. He reminded me there's also an app called Zozi. Zozi also blew up uh, because it did home delivery in 15 minutes. So that was something, a uh, very South African app and product that was developed that gets you um, your food or groceries or anything that you need within 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. that was something else. Um, so Clubhouse did come to South Africa. A lot of my friends tried to get me onto it, but it died because again, yes. familiarity, people are like, well, we have WhatsApp. Why don't we just keep keep to WhatsApp? <laughs> I'm not on WhatsApp because of how, how many people thought that they could call me after oh. working out. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm at home now. Stop calling me. So, um, yeah, yeah actually, not, that's I'm an not. interesting thing. It's in the culture. So you mostly like, is it call calls um, like that are popular or texts or because it's also in the business um, in the business culture. Are you like calling each other or spontaneously? Absolutely. Or Absolutely. So I find that most people will spend their money because data is so expensive. They won't buy airtime. Airtime is what allows for you to make a phone call. Data is what allows for you to access the internet. So now people would rather spend their money on data than they would on airtime because on WhatsApp, it consumes your data at a very slow rate because mm. the content gets so com like compressed for WhatsApp that you can watch short clips and not use a lot of it. But you can also not make phone calls and it is so much more affordable to make phone calls on WhatsApp and conduct your business. So people will send quotes via WhatsApp. They will email via WhatsApp. And I was just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I need a separation between my personal life and my business life. Um, so I don't use WhatsApp and I know a lot of business partners find it hugely frustrating, but I'm like, my email still works and my phone number still works. Yay. So you can still access me. <laughs> Nice. That's that's really interesting um, uh, detail to know because you know this business culture is all can be tricky when you enter a new market. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> the other day, um, one of the um, colleagues <laughs> of mine uh, just texted me um, his phone number, saying, "Yeah, we should have a call." And what I did, uh, I just you know that was um, like. Uh, almost an instinct like automatic decision I sent him my calendly link for, for him to book a call through zoom or google meet and he was like but I gave you my phone number you can just call me and I was like, okay, really you can call people without booking that <laughs> you know <laughs> yes yeah so there's probably also a generational um because you're revealing your age now to me and maybe I was uh, revealing yeah. my age <laughs> and that Gen Z is like, what do you mean? I can dial a number and there's a phone <laughs> ring. But I'm a I'm millennial like... still. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm a millennial. So for me, yeah, people make me, they try to make me feel really old because I'm like, just call me on my number. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, hey, that's an interesting yeah, thing to, to think of before you start your um, negotiations in the new market. Thanks so much. I guess no, absolutely. Um, we do, uh, yeah, we don't have any other questions, but guys, let us know if you 
want to, oh, oh you actually had uh, Nabuntu's uh, contacts or, or, you know, during all the webinar before your eyes. So you can um, contact her or contact us and we uh, will let you know. Yeah, and um, just let's go to South Africa. I actually really, really want to go there. I've got some friends. Yeah, yeah please there. come. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think the exciting thing um, is that we're part of the BRICS cluster. I don't know if you know the BRICS cluster, yes. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So I think that there's a lot of similarities in those emerging markets. And I'd say for young entrepreneurs and young business people, even established businesses and young entrepreneurs, engaging in these new emerging markets right now is so much more exciting because we are in a position to create something new. And that's why I came back home after all that time in London, because London and America and a lot of these established European countries have it's so saturated it's mm -hmm. really so hard to break into those markets and so at least with us in our emerging economies there's still an opportunity to create something new there's still a lot of social problems so they need a lot of solutions and partnering with emerging markets and emerging businesses is definitely slower but it's more sustainable and the potential to scale up is more exciting and, and it could happen really quite rapidly if you develop a solution that is attractive to consumers. And so I'd say definitely come visit us. We'd love to have you in South Yay. Africa. Yay. Yeah. And I'll come visit in Russia or yeah. wherever you are. <laughs> yeah, we're all like we're distributed. So some of some of the people are in Eastern, Eastern Europe, some are in Russia, some are in Western Europe, so some are in London actually. Yeah, so it's great. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, and bye guys. Thank you so much. See you at the next webinar tomorrow. It will be about India. So yeah, looking forward to it. See you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.